My uh, master's thesis research was on freshwater mussels. Um, freshwater mussels uh, are a group of bivalve mollusks in the order, order Unionida. Um, they live in the benthic zone of freshwater ecosystems like uh, streams and, and lakes. Um, down there, they filter feed and they also deposit feed. Um, most people are familiar with filter feeding uh, in bivalves where basically um, they pump water through um, an aperture or a, a siphon um, like the ones you can see here. Um, this is the in-current siphon where the muscle pumps water into, uh, and then this is the ex-current siphon uh, where the, the muscle ejects, you know, uh, waste products and things like that, uh, which I'll talk about here in a second a little more. Um, but uh, what, the, what the muscle does is it'll use um, cilia to, to pump water in, and it'll sort the, the organic and or inorganic matter um, and basically it'll decide, you know, what it, what it wants to eat um, and what it doesn't want to eat, both organics and, and inorganics. Um, and anything it doesn't want to eat, um, it will eject out of its excurrent siphon or um, aperture um, in basically this mucus bound aggregate of inorganics and organic material um, called pseudofeces. And I, I only mention that because um, uh, it, it's, it'll become Im important um, to some of my uh, results later on. Um, also, uh, anything that passes through the digestive system and it actually, you know, digests, um, it will, uh, you know, release or eject uh, feces as well. Um, so most people are familiar with uh, filter feeding in bivalves. Uh, people are less um, less familiar with uh, deposit feeding, which is basically where the muscle will ingest sediment um, and it will strip away that organic material that is clinging onto the sediment as well as in the interstitial spaces of it. Um, so they use these two feeding modes um, to uh, feed on a diverse, pretty diverse assemblage of aquatic organisms which include phytoplankton, uh, bacteria, and potentially, or zo zooplankton as well, and potentially some other um, sources, but uh, our understanding of the muscle diet, uh, freshwater muscle diet is um, still rather coarse. Um, so their position in the benthos of freshwater ecosystems uh, make them, and, and their feeding behaviors make them uh, very important, um, ecologically speaking. Um, so their, um, their, like I was saying, their position uh, kind of makes them couplers um, between the pelagic zone, which is, is the water column, uh, and the benthic zone. Um, they do this by, like I said, filter feeding. They filter, filter out the organic material from the water column, um, and, and then they uh, deposit feces and pseudofeces, um, which can transfer uh, that, those or, that organic matter from the pelagic zone to the benthic zone, um, which really shuttles the, you know, that energy um, and nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus into the benthic zone, which can facilitate other organisms um, like paraphyton um, and other aquatic organisms. Um, additionally, uh, they're important um, or provide uh, because they provide some some habitat as well um, with their hard shells, um, both you know um, while they're living and post mortem too, because the the shell lives on. Um, mussels are also pretty unique in that they're obligate um, parasites, primarily on fish. Um, so they their larvae, which which are called glochidia, uh, require um, contact with. Uh, uh, gills, a gill tissue um, to continue their development. So a female mussel uh, will contain inside her uh, these glochidia um, in her gills and she'll need to make contact with, uh, with the fish's gills somehow. So she will um, try to attract the fish host and there are, um, there's quite a diversity of attraction strategies that mussels use, but here are a few of them. Um, this is these two here are mantle lures. Um, basically the fish will just try to attract, or the, the muscle will try to attract the, the fish host um, with something that looks like some sort of prey item, like a small minnow or um, insect or something like that. And um, hopefully, you know, the fish host will be attracted to it. 
and it'll try to take a bite of, of out of that mantle, um, that lure. And um, upon doing so, the freshwater mussel will actually eject its glochidia um, into the mouth of the, the host fish where the uh, glochidia will then attach, um, which this is a picture showing that, um, where these are the glochidia and the rest of it is pretty much the gill tissue. Um, there they will be encapsulated by the uh, gill tissue and they'll have a nice oxygen and nutrient rich um, environment to grow and develop into juvenile mussels. Uh, once they do so, um, they will then fall off the fish, the fish host and land um, in the benthos where they'll live the rest of their lives. Unfortunately, these pretty unique and uh, important creatures are experiencing some pretty severe declines. Um, currently 70% are considered imperiled and uh, about 30 species have already gone extinct in North America. Um, the beginning of these declines really started in the early 20th century um, because of dams, but more recent declines, so post 1960, 1970 um, to the present day, have been uh, have been caused by an unknown um, an unknown source. Um, these have been called enigmatic declines as a result. You can see uh, this map here shows the um, spatial occurrence of enigmatic declines in the United States. These gray polygons represent um, Huck 8 level watersheds that are experiencing uh, population declines, or, or enigmatic declines, excuse me. Um, the, these declines uh, present several uh, characteristics, um, including, uh, there's like seven total, I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but uh, one of them is the cessation of juvenile muscle, or juvenile recruitment, which basically means that there's an absence or um, very few juvenile mussels present within those populations. Um, this is important because it, it could provide several clues as to what might be causing um, enigmatic declines. Uh, for example, um, juvenile mussels are particularly vulnerable to things like elevated ammonia, as well as um, competition with um, invasive species, like the Asian clam. Um, or corbicula. Um, corbicula is sort of a prime suspect in enigmatic uh, declines because um, it arrived in the southeastern United States around 1960, 1970, and then spread throughout the region. Um, and coincidentally, uh, that was around the same time that enigmatic declines um, began. Um, so this kind of, you know, makes it a, a bit of an obvious candidate. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's been largely ignored over the years as a potential factor in enigmatic declines. Um, just as a uh, as kind of an, a side note, um, this this uh, range map of Corbicula is a little bit misleading. Um, these gaps really don't exist in its distribution, and it it occurs in those areas too. Um, there was just there was just no record of it there. Um, so even though it's been largely ignored, there, there is some, some evidence that it, it does affect um, freshwater mussels. Um, this study was done on one to three day old juvenile mussels in the laboratory, and they looked at how corbicula density um, affected juvenile mussel growth and mortality. And what they found was that um, an increase in corbicula densities, a pretty um, severe negative effect on growth and also in um, an increase in mortality, and as you can see by the um, this treatment here at 1,260 corbicula per meter squared, um, mortality was 100%. So um, with these really, really young muscles, so one to three day old muscles are um, you know around 200 microns um, in size, which is really, really small. So the um, authors uh, concluded that this high mortality, these really severe effects, were due to um, ingestion of the muscles by corbicula. Um, now, something uh, that's, that is, um, I guess, a bit of a, um, the, the, the results of this study and like how they generalize to the wild are a little unclear um, because they, in their experimental systems, they used a really small volume of water. Um, I think it was like 1.5 milliliters or something like that, uh, which is really, really small and probably um, cause these really severe effects. So although, you know, there's definitely a suggestion here that corbicula does um, negatively affect juvenile muscles, 
it's still a bit unclear as to how this actually generalizes to the wild. Some more recent studies um, have also uh, shown that there could be some context dependence uh, going on with uh, corbicula freshwater muscle interactions. Um, so this study looked at three levels of trophic condition, um, eutrophic, mesotrophic, and oligotrophic, um, uh, in combination with three levels of temperature, 20 degrees, 24, and 28 degrees Celsius. Um, and then they, they, as a response variable, they looked at uh, freshwater, adult freshwater muscle um, fecal productivity uh, in the absence and presence of corbicula. Um, so what they found was that there was only a negative effect on fecal productivity in freshwater mussels exposed to corbicula um, only in the 20 degrees Celsius and eutrophic or high food abundant conditions um, and no other treatment was significant. Um, fecal productivity um, is sort of a measurement of energy assimilation where the, you know, the thinking is like if there's less feces being produced, then there's less energy going in. Um, so, you know, this is kind of another study where it's a bit unclear uh, what this actually means. Um, but it does show that, you know, there's probably some um, effect of corbicula and that it's context dependent. <clears throat> um, another follow-up or similar, similar study to the, the previous one um, was done in the field. And they looked at uh, adult freshwater mussel growth and carbohydrate content um, on a range of corbicula um, densities. And what they found was that it, it might take a substantial uh, amount or high density of corbicula to actually in, invoke a significant effect on growth and carbohydrate content of adult freshwater mussels. Um, so what they found was that there was, there was only a, a significant difference in pairwise comparisons um, between the 2000 um, corbicula treatment and the control. And there were no other significant differences in the pairwise comparisons uh, at lower corbicula densities. So 2000 um, corbicula per meter squared might be needed um, in order to actually like invoke this competition with adult freshwater mussels anyway. Um, so together, these findings show that corbicula may have a negative effect on freshwater mussels, uh, but uh, the mechanism is still unknown. It may be food competition, um, and also the conditions invoking this interaction are not really well understood. Um, additionally, you know, these studies have several um, kind of weaknesses, um, like you know, using very small volumes of water and not providing a, a ton of detail um, in their uh, papers. So it's, it's really difficult to, to tell how these previous studies um, really generalize you know, to the wild. So because of that, my objectives, or the objectives of my uh, master's thesis research were really to address you know, how does food abundance specifically um, affect interactions between corbicula and freshwater mussels. So I had three objectives, um, which were to determine how food abundance, corbicula biomass, and the interaction between food abundance and corbicular biomass affected the growth and survival of juvenile freshwater mussels. And really the emphasis of my master's thesis research was that interaction, um, the, object, the third objective, which was um, the interaction effect. So um, I ran a total of four experiments at the Center for Mouse Conservation um, in Frankfort, Kentucky. Um, and I conducted these experiments from the 22nd of May to the 27th of August, 2019. Um, so uh, I used two batches of one juvenile mussel species, which was the Cumberland bean. Uh, this is a, uh, a species that's endemic to the Cumberland River watershed in southeastern Kentucky, and it is a host specialist on um, darter species. So I infected two separate batches of fantail darter um, uh, uh, artificially on the 15th of January and the 27th of March, 2019. Um, and this artificial infection, um, it, it, you know, it, it mimics sort of the, uh, the natural infection where uh, basically you take a pipette and you um, directly place the glochidia onto the gills of the, the host fish. Um, after those fish were infected, I held them in these aquatic habitat systems shown here um, for about a month until uh, juvenile mussels began to, to fall off the fish. 
um, at which point I collected them and then brought them into this uh, recirculating aquaculture system. Um, so um, this recirculating aquaculture system basically is, um, it has a feeding cone, which algae and water is put into, and then that mixture is dispensed into this mixing tank. Um, from there, the, the water algae mixture is gravity fed into these flow through trays, which is where the mussels were. Um, those contained sediment um, as well as the juvenile mussels. From there, the, the water from all of the trays is drained into this common sump here, um, and then is recirculated back up into the mix tank and then um, down into the flow through trays once again. Uh, water in the system was exchanged um, using these timed uh, water removal systems as well as a timed water, fresh water supply where there was a complete exchange of the system's water um, once every 24 hours. So I reared juvenile mussels in these systems um, for about three to five months just depending on um, the experiment. Um, and while they were in this recirculating aquaculture system, I fed them a mixed species diet. Um, which include two, included two freshwater cultured algae um, that were cultured at the Center for Miles Conservation, uh, Chlorella sorokiniana, um, which is a green microalgae, and then Phyodactylium tricornutum, which is a, um, a diatom, and that one's shown here. Um, and then in addition, uh, I fed them three commercially available algae from reed mariculture, uh, Thalassia, Thalassia cera, pseudonana, always had trouble with that one. Um, nanochloropsis, a mixture of nanochloropsis species, which is this, uh, these green microalgae here, and then a six species mixture of marine microalgae called shellfish diet. Um, this diet has been uh, formulated at the Center for Miles Conservation to produce healthy growth and survival um, of juvenile mussels in those recirculating aquaculture systems. And it's, it's meant to provide um, an adequate amount of macronutrients um, in terms of proteins, carbohydrates, and um, lipids. So I uh, modified the standard RAS, or the um, recirculating aquaculture system that I used to rear juvenile mussels um, for my experimental system. And the, um, the major reduction, or the major uh, modification of this experimental RAS um, from the standard RAS was that it just had a smaller total volume um, with major reductions in volume coming from the mixed tank here and also the sump. Um, in addition, it only fed eight flow through trays um, compared to the uh, rearing recirculating aquaculture system, which fed um, 14. I made this modification so that I could um, have more than one recirculating aquaculture system to, to do my experiments. Um, the reason being is because you can only put one quantity of food into the feeding cone at one time, um, or so all the, you know, all the trays would be supplied with the same amount of food. Um, so if I wanted to have more than one food level, I would need more than one recirculating aquaculture system. And so um, I developed three uh, of these in total. Um, so I characterized muscle food abundance within uh, the systems as well as within the field, and I'll get to that here in a bit, using um, total organic suspended solids. This is uh, basically synonymous with fine particulate organic matter um, and basically represents a, a range of about 0.7 microns to um, 1,000 uh, microns of particulate size. Um, how I arrived at this measurement, I, I basically vacuum filtered uh, 500 to 2000 milliliter water samples um, through uh, glass fiber filters that were 0.7 microns in size. Um, and you can kind of see the aftermath of um, this filtration process um, with this being the filter with algae on it. After that, I would dry the filters over here um, at 104 degrees Celsius for one hour in a drying oven. And then I'd weigh them and then uh, after that, I would ash them at 100 or 550 degrees Celsius um, for one hour in a muffle furnace. Um, so that allowed me to calculate TOSS as the dry mass minus ash mass uh, per liter volume. 
During my experiments, I measured four water quality parameters, pH, ammonia, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. Um, I basically did this to just make sure that um, my conditions were uh, environmentally relevant, as well as just make sure there was no adverse water quality occurring um, during any of my experiments. So um, I ran the first experiment with the objectives to develop experimental food abundances um, that replicated a range of environmentally relevant food abundances. Um, additionally, I wanted to evaluate how juvenile muscle growth at these experimental food abundances corresponded to juvenile muscle growth in the wild. So really the the objective of this experiment was just to make sure that my um, subsequent results, you know, results in subsequent experiments could be generalized to the wild and that conditions, you know, uh, were, um, were comparable to, uh, to the wild. So I used the mixed species diet that I um, described earlier uh, to develop three levels of food abundance, um, a high, which um, approximately equaled the standard uh, ration at the Center for Miles Conservation used to rear juvenile mussels. Um, I chose this as the high level because, um, like I said earlier, it's been kind of fine-tuned to produce high growth and, and high survival within these systems. Um, I then created a medium level, which was 50% of the, the high ration, and then a low, which was 25% of um, the high ration. I felt like this range really encompassed a range of food availability uh, for the mussels. And you can kind of see that range here in this, the tray water, where it goes from darkest water to, to clearest water from left to right. And this, so this being the high, medium, and this the low. Um, so I was hoping that this, this range would really encompass the range of um, food abundances in the wild. So for this experiment, I evaluated one factor, food abundance, um, which had three levels, and then uh, and, and in relation to two response variables, um, Cumberland bean growth and survival. Uh, and I did this by randomly assigning each recirculating aquaculture system to one food abundance level, which was, uh, is kind of shown here. And then I randomly assigned two trays in each recirculating aquaculture system with 10 haphazardly selected mussels. Um, so I ran this experiment from the 22nd of May to the 11th of June, 2019. Um, and I measured each muscle individually before uh, going into these flow through trays. And you can kind of see that process here where basically you just take the, the measurement of the longest side of the, uh, the muscle. At the start of this experiment, muscles were 2.5 millimeters on average. Um, water temperature during the experiment was 24.7 to 26.7 degrees Celsius. Um, and I measured TOSS on days one, nine, and 21. Um, I, tr I cleaned trays um, as well as mixing tanks and sumps. And I did this uh, just to make sure that there was, uh, there weren't, um, or just to reduce the colonization of um, uh, potentially harmful aquatic organisms like green blue algae um, in the systems. And I, I cleaned these components using acetic acid, uh, water and uh, sponges. So during experiment one, there was no evidence of adverse water quality. Um, there was no difference in pH or DO among treatments. Um, ammonia and temperature differed significantly among treatments where ammonia tended to be higher in treatments with more food, um, but there was, the magnitude of differences was, was very small um, and um, Overall, ammonia was very, very low. Um, only, I think the, the maximum was like 0.04 total um, nitrogen. And then uh, temperature also differed significantly among treatments, but um, there was no real pattern in the data. And once again, um, uh, the magnitude of differences was, was pretty small. I think it was less than one degree Celsius. Um, so to compare the food abundances from the uh, wild to my experiment, I collected uh, water samples at 14 stream sites um, shown here in this map. Um, uh, these stream sites um, were in three different physiographic provinces within Kentucky. Um, and I collected water samples at each of these and then um, brought them back to the laboratory and measured TOSS like I uh, described previously. Um, I also compared growth from the wild to growth from the laboratory um, by comparing some data previously collected by my collaborators. 
Um, they, in that study, they um, deployed these flow through chambers shown here called muscle silos, uh, where they placed Cumberland bean inside them and then deploy them at 17 stream sites in the Rock Castle River. Um, these sites were different than the ones shown in this map, um, but they exposed them to these ambient stream conditions um, for a few months and then measured growth. For data analysis, I um, expressed growth as instantaneous growth. So this is basically the factor by which muscles grew per day. Um, and, and I express survival as the proportion um, surviving in each tray. And I ArcSign transformed it for further analysis because it was a proportion. Um, growth and survival met assumptions of normality, um, but both did not meet assumptions of homogeneity of variance. Um, so I evaluated the relationship between the two response variables, growth and survival, and the one factor, food abundance, um, using a Welch's heteroscedastic F-test. Um, I used this procedure because it's robust to violations of homogeneity of variance. Um, and I did uh, a separate Welch's ANOVA for, for each growth and survival. Um, I also did a, a one-way analysis of variance on um, TOSS with, as the response variable and food level um, as the factor. And I just did this to make sure my, my food levels were actually significantly different from each other. Um, and I found that uh, the food levels separated out um, pretty well, um, but the low and medium were not significantly different from each other, and the medium and high were not significantly different from each other. Um, but overall, food level um, was significant in explaining differences in TOSS. Um, something worth noting is there were, there were a couple outliers here in the low food level, um, which could have been caused by just aggregation of algae um, in a couple of those uh, filters. I'm not really sure. Overall, it, it appeared that my uh, food levels were significantly different though. Um, as expected, growth increased uh, in food levels with more food. Um, and overall, it was significantly different among the levels. However, it was a, a bit marginal there at, at 0 0.06. Um, the low and the medium food levels were significantly different um, for growth but the medium and high were um, more similar and not, not significantly different from each other. Um, this may represent some uh, maximal growth threshold uh, where after you know, that medium food level, uh, there's just not a lot more, you know, not much more growth to be, to be had. Um, I'm not really sure. There's really, there really wasn't much going on with survival um, and survival was not statistically um, significant or different among the the treatments, each of these um, represents one of the treatment replicates for each food level, um, and there were two for each. Um, there's really no pattern, um, and overall, uh, it was not um, significantly different among the treatments. So when comparing uh, food abundance from the wild to, or from the 14 stream sites shown here, um, to the three experimental food abundances, I found that my experimental food abundances fit within the distribution of the 14 stream sites um, in the context of TOSS. Um, the high seemed to be very similar to the highest, um, the highest food abundance stream, which was Slate Creek. Um, the medium fit with, seemed to fit within somewhere in the middle of the distribution. Um, the low, however, was a little bit high compared to um, stream, some of the lowest streams, which were like Horse Lake Creek and Little South Fork. Um, and the low was about double the TOSS of those streams. Um, so uh, it, it, it appeared that my, my um, food abundances were environmentally relevant. Uh, when you compare the experimental TOSS, the um, mean experimental TOSS um, to the stream TOSS, my experiment my experimental um, food levels were about 27% higher um, in the context of TOSS than the streams. Um, but when we look over here at growth, uh, you can see that there's a, a definite shift in the distribution where growth in the 17 stream sites um, is now much larger than um, the growth in the, uh, in the three levels of the experiment. Um, and when we look at um, the averages, we see that the experimental growth is 25% um, less than stream growth. 
this is pretty interesting because um, like the food abundance, or like I was, I was saying with the food abundance, it was overall higher in the experiment, but then it produced lower growth than the wild. Um, this could represent some type of difference in food quality between um, the wild and the lab. Uh, like I was saying earlier, it's likely that mussels eat a pretty diverse assemblage of aquatic organisms. And um, the phytoplankton uh, obviously produces really good growth, but it just may not be quite equivalent in terms of food quality um, to the wild. Um, one thing worth noting, and I, I really apologize for these photos. I couldn't, this, these were under the microscope and I, I couldn't uh, find better ones. But um, one thing worth noting about uh, experiment one was uh, were mussels in the low food treatment. Um, this is a mussel uh, from the low food treatment. You can see the, the color of the um, shell here is pretty uniform. Um, it's kind of that beige brown. Um, when you compare it to this muscle on the right, uh, you can see this dark streak um, going into this, this dark spot there in the middle of the muscle. Um, this represents the digestive tract of the, um, the muscle, this being the intestine and this being the gut. Um, and this shows that this muscle is eating a lot of food because the digestive system is jam-packed with food. Um, in comparison, this muscle on, in the low food level um, didn't appear to be eating a whole lot of food. And overall, muscles in this low food treatment um, looked like this muscle here. So they likely were just not eating a whole lot of food, even though they did grow a little bit. So in summary, um, my experimental food abundances and growth were environmentally relevant. Um, and something interesting that we found was that there was higher growth in the wild than the experiment, which could suggest some differences in food quality um, between the two because food abundances were comparable or greater um, overall in the experiment. So now that I've really nailed down my environmentally relevant conditions, um, I wanted to uh, attend to my overarching objective um, or objectives which um, really centered around this interaction between food abundance and corbicular biomass and how it affected growth and survival of juvenile mussels. Um, so I ran another experiment, experiment two, um, and my hypotheses, uh, the first one was that um, increased food abundance would have a positive effect on growth and survival. Um, my second was that increased corbicular biomass would have a negative effect on growth and survival. And the emphasis, like I was saying, of, of the studies was that the interaction between corbicular biomass and food abundance um, would have a significant effect on growth and survival of juvenile Cumberland beans, such that the strength of competition by corbicula increases with decreasing food abundance. So for experiment two, I selected uh, three different food levels than the ones I used in experiment one. Um, so I doubled the food quantity of the medium and the high. Um, I did this to hopefully replicate uh, wild growth a little bit better, um, as well as increase the overall range of food abundances in my three levels, because like we saw last time, um, the pairwise comparisons indicated that uh, some of the levels were not significantly different. Um, I also increased the low food level by about 50%, and I did this just um, to prevent kind of that starvation I was seeing in uh, the low food level in experiment one. So um, I collected over a thousand corbicula from North Elkhorn Creek um, on the 31st of June, 2019 um, to, use, to be used in the experiment. Um, I placed the, the corbicula into um, coolers that were aerated uh, and filled with river water. And then I transported them back to the Center for Moss Conservation. Um, um, after, after doing so, I then um, acclimated the corbicula to laboratory water uh, by exchanging about one liter of laboratory water with one liter of uh, river water um, once every about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and I did that for about three to four hours. Um, after acclimation, I put them into this flow through tank, which is shown here, um, and uh, aerated it and supplied them with the mixed species alkyl diet um, used, for, used to rear juvenile mussels. Um, so 
Uh, after that, I selected four levels of corbicula biomass to be used as treatments um, in my experiment. Uh, a control which had zero grams, cor zero grams of corbicula in each tray, a low with 3.7 grams per tray, a medium at 32 grams per tray, and a high at 186.5 grams per tray. Um, and these correspond to densities that are frequently reported in the wild, going from zero to um, about 910 corbicula per meter squared. And you can see what those treatments looked like in the flow through trays, this being the low, the medium, and the high. Um, so I evaluated the relationship between the two factors, um, food abundance, which had three levels, in combination with the four levels of corbicula biomass. So I used a full factorial design um, to evaluate the two response variables, juvenile muscle growth and survival. Um, these two digit, two digit codes represent a treatment combination where the first um, code is the food abundance level and the second digit in the code is the uh, corbicula biomass level. This resulted in 12 unique treatment combinations and I did two replicates on each treatment. Um, I randomly assigned each RAS to one food abundance level, and I randomly assigned each corbicula biomass to two trays in each RAS. Uh, for the experiment, I haphazardly selected batches of 20 juvenile muscles and measured each individually, uh, like in experiment one. Um, I randomly assigned these batches of 20 juvenile muscles to trays within recirculating aquaculture systems. Um, and at the beginning of the experiment, muscles were five months old and had a mean length of 4.4 millimeters. Um, I ran experiment two from the 5th of July to the 22nd of July, 2019. And once again, like experiment one, I measured general water quality, clean system components, measured TOSS, um, like previously described, and then remeasured muscles on the final day. Um, once again, it didn't appear that there were any signs of adverse water quality. There were no differences in DEO. Uh, there were differences in, in ammonia, pH, and temperature among treatments, uh, where I found that temperature and ammonia was higher in treatments with greater corbicula. Um, ammonia, that, that's, that was kind of to be expected. Increasing the number of organisms in those trays would increase ammonia, um, but it never got to kind of a, um, it, they, they never, those levels never got to like a lethal um, level by any means. There was one outlier in a high in the high, which was like 1.0 uh, milligrams per liter, but it it subsequently um, stabilized at, at a much lower level. Um, temperature uh, temperature was like I said was higher in treatments with greater corbicula, and that might have just been a result of you know increased you know um, uh, organisms like in the in the trays which increase the temperature overall. Um, pH was lower in treatments with greater food abundance. Probably the biological activity uh, and breaking down of, of that food caused uh, a bit lower pH. Um, for data analysis, once again I measured the two response variables instantaneous growth and survival um, and I arc sign transformed uh, survival for further analysis. Um, I evaluated the relationship between the two response variables, growth and survival, and the two factors, corbicular biomass and food abundance, um, using a two-way analysis of variance, uh, which included both of the main effect terms, corbicular and food, as well as the interaction term, uh, corbicular times food. I also did a, an analysis on total organic suspended solids, just to see if corbicular or food or the interaction uh, were having an effect on TOSS. Um, so I, I, once again, I use the two factors, corbicular biomass and, and food abundance as main effect terms, and then also include the interaction term, corbicular times food, um, and did a, did a two-way ANOVA. For the full model uh, for growth, I found that food was significant to the model, um, but corbicular and the interaction term were not significant. Um, and as expected, uh, as growth increased, or sorry, as food increased, um, instantaneous growth increased. And um, with the addition of these new food uh, levels that I had in this experiment, um, each pairwise comparison, your each food level was uh, significantly different for growth. Um, yeah, I think that's all I had. Um, corbicula, the, the relationship between corbicula and growth, uh, I found that there was no, you know, like, like the model suggested, there was really no 
um, relationship going on there. And as you can see, uh, there is really no pattern in the data where um, you know, there's no effect on growth um, at those increased corbicula abundances. Um, for the full, uh, for the full, mat, full model for survival, uh, corbicula was marginally significant to the model with a p-value of 0.08, and food and the interaction term um, were not significant. Um, but when we look at the data for survival um, in, in relation to corbicula, there's really not a whole lot going on, and overall survival is over 90% in all of the trays. Um, the only notable thing is that there's, you know, there's increased variation in survival in the control and also the high treatment. Um, not really sure what that means exactly, but um, I really don't think there's, there's a whole lot that's informative here. Um, Similarly, when we look at survival for, uh, compared to each food level, um, there was not a significant difference in survival among the food levels and survival was, was very, very, very high, over 90% on average um, for this experiment. For the two-factor model with interaction for TOSS, food was significant to the model, um, but corbicula and the interaction term uh, were not significant. and um, when we look at TOSS in each of the uh, treatment combinations uh, here on the y-axis, oops, um, we see that uh, the only thing having an effect on TOSS was the food treatment and corbicula seemed to have no effect, at least in each tray, on TOSS. So each of these two letter codes um, represents a treatment combination. The first letter being the food level, L for low, N for medium, H for high, and then the second letter being the um, corbicula treatment, C for control, L for low, N for medium, and H for high. Um, and as you can see, within each of the, um, within each of the food treatments, uh, all the TOSS in the, in, uh, among the corbicula treatments is pretty much the same. And so there's really not, not a whole lot going on there. Um, so in summary, food abundance did affect growth, but not survival. Um, corbicula didn't affect growth or survival, which was kind of unexpected. Um, and this could have several explanations. The first is that corbicula effects are species specific. So it could just be that Cumberland bean is not affected as much by corbicula as some other species might be. Um, the second and more plausible explanation is that corbicula has a system-wide effect on TOSS in the wrasses or you know, the food available to mussels in the wrasses and doesn't affect each individual tray. Um, and this is kind of supported by the design of the recirculating aquaculture system. So like I said earlier, you put one food quantity into the feeding cone and then it's dispensed into the mix tank and then that food quantity is distributed among the flow through trays. Um, so remember, each corbicula treatment was in a separate tray. Um, so all of the, the water from the trays would flow into this common sump. So basically, even if corbicula took a little bit of food out of a tray, um, all of the water would go back into the sump and then be recirculated up back into the systems. So it's unlikely that corbicula was really having enough effect on the trays, the water in the trays, um, to really make a difference um, for the system as a whole. And it's likely that the total biomass of all the corbicula in there are having effect on the entire recirculating aquaculture system, not just the trays. And that's further supported by this, um, this here, which showed that you know basically at a tray level, um, corbicula was not, you know, doing anything uh, to TOSS. So experiment three um, was really to uh, basically adjust for that, you know, that system-wide effect that corbicula probably had on TOSS or the lack of, you know, the lack of an effect at each tray. So really I just needed, I once again had the same objectives, um, but this time just, uh, you know, manipulated the system so that um, it would, so that I could actually test my effects. Um, so I collected, had to collect some more corbicula because there was some mortality in experiment two. Um, and then I developed three levels of corbicula biomass, um, a control at zero grams within a recirculating aquaculture system, a medium 
at 156.6 grams and a 2000 or and a high at 2147 grams. And what I mean by changing the design, so um, each recirculating aquaculture system, remember I had three of them, um, was treated as a corbicula treatment. Um, so one of them was randomly assigned with zero grams corbicula, one of them was randomly assigned with 156.6 grams corbicula, and the last one was randomly assigned with, with 2,147 grams corbicula. Each at, each at one food level. So I chose two food levels for, for this uh, experiment. One food level that um, was very, very similar to these low TOSS streams like Horselet Creek and Little South Fork, and then a high food abundance that was still within range of this um, high TOSS stream, Slate Creek. So I ran two separate experiments, each with a single factor design um, to evaluate the relationship between corbicular biomass, food abundance, and the two response variables. Uh, running two experiments were, was not ideal, um, but the conditions were so similar that I was, uh, in terms of water quality and things like that, that I was able to, to pull the data of the two experiments together. So the first experiment I ran was the high food, um, at the high food abundance. Um, so I, like I said earlier, I randomly assigned each RAS to one level of corbicula biomass, and then I ran, or I assigned three, all three RASs to the high food level. Um, in this experiment, mussels were three months old, had a mean length of 3.75 millimeters, and had a mean batch mass of 0.22 grams. So the batch mass, that is all the mussels in a tray, and for this experiment, there were 20. Um, I then did an, uh, an, a subsequent experiment at the low food abundance uh, using the same design. The only difference is that um, there was a low food abundance um, in all of the all three of the recirculating aquaculture systems. Additionally, mussels were four months old, um, had a mean length of 4.85 millimeters, and had a uh, mean batch mass of 0.53 grams. So um, for, this, for these experiments, I placed batches of 20 mussels in four randomly chosen trays within each um, recirculating aquaculture system. Um, I, once again, I cleaned the system components, uh, measured general water quality, and um, like previously described, and re-measured batch mass on the final day of each experiment. Um, so for food abundance, I measured TOSS once again. Um, but this time I also measured algal cell density. Um, and I took this measurement um, by collecting water samples um, from tray water. And then from those samples, I, I took 10 microliter subsamples and counted algal cells using a hemocytometer. Very tedious, very time consuming, um, but it is cool to see those algae under the microscope. Um, so I decided to use this algal cell density as kind of a supplemental measurement just to make sure TOSS, you know, um, TOSS was, you know, also a good measurement and to kind of have a backup. And after taking um, algal cell densities as well as TOSS from several of my stream sites, um, I found that they were, you know, highly, highly related um, to one another, which was, was good validation of the measurements. Um, during these experiments, there was no adverse water quality, uh, no differences in pH, temperature, or DO among the corbicula treatments in either of the food experiments um, or the food levels. Um, ammonia was significantly different among corbicula treatments once again, but overall it was very low. I think it was, it was um, under 0.06 or 0.07. So for data analysis, um, uh, for the response variables of food abundance, which were TOSS and cell density, I evaluated one main effect term, corbicula, um, in each of the food treatments separately, uh, each using a one-way analysis of variance. Um, I then uh, analyzed survival um, with corbicula as the main effect term in both food uh, treatments separately using a Kruskal Wallace rank sum test. Um, I used a Kruskal Wallace rank sum test because um, it's a non-parametric method when the data exhibit non-normality, which the survival data in both food treatments did. Um, and really, I guess the bread and butter of the study um, was this model here, the growth model. 
um, that included both the main effect terms, corbicula and food, as well as the interaction term, corbicula times food. And like I said, uh, or kind of alluded to earlier, I pulled the data together from these two food um, experiments because water quality were not sig significantly different um, for any of the water quality parameters. Um, and I did this using a weighted least squares regression. Um, I, I did this procedure because um, the classic one-way analysis of variance um, exhibited uh, non-constant variance across the um, fitted values. Um, so I, I chose to use a weighted least squares uh, regression, which is um, robust to non-constant variance. Um, I also did to follow up the, the you know, the interaction uh, or the full model, I ran one-way models um, for growth, which included only corbicula as the main effect term. Um, and in the high food treatment, I used the weighted least squares regression um, because there was non-constant variance in a one-way ANOVA I ran initially. Um, and then, um, or an ordinary least squares regression. No, no, it was one-way ANOVA. Um, and then for growth in the low food, um, with corbicula as the main effect term, I used a classic one-way analysis of variance. Um, so for the um, food abundances in terms of cell density and TOSS within each of the food experiments, you see that as corbicula biomass increases, there's a significant reduction in TOSS and cell density, and they line up really, really well. Um, cell density and TOSS really line up well um, with each other and the patterns are almost identical. Um, and this really validated that this new design uh, worked. You know, it, um, within the systems, the corbicula did reduce the amount of food available to the, to the muscles. Um, for, the sur for survival, survival was really high in these, um, in, at both the low and the high food abundance. Um, and it was uh, over 90% um, in both, both experiments. The only thing worth noting here for survival is there was more variability in survival um, in the high, food, or high corbicula treatments. Um, but other than that, uh, like I said, survival was really high, so there's not much here that's very informative. Um, so the emphasis of my entire study, the, the full model for growth um, with food and corbicula's main effects and the interaction effect, um, I found that all um, factors or you know, all terms in the model were significant, including the interaction term, uh, which was really cool. Um, and uh, this interaction term indicated that uh, the effect from corbicula was dependent on the food abundance, um, and that made it difficult to evaluate those main effect terms in this model. Um, so when we look at each of the, so after doing this full model, um, like I said, I ran one-way tests um, using um, the ANOVA and the weighted least squares regression. And in the high food treatment, I found, you know, basically what I hypothesized, which was that um, there'd be essentially no effect with, you know, um, abundance and abundance of food. Um, there was a marginal, sig marginally significant difference um, overall at 0.10. Um, but as you can see by each pairwise comparison, um, all the, the growth with among each of those treatments was not significantly different. There is a bit of a suggestion of, you know, less growth in the medium and high corbicular treatments compared to the control. Um, but overall, not, you know, not evidence of strong competition here between corbicula and um, the juvenile muscles in terms of growth. Now, complete bombshell, totally um, opposite of what I hypothesized in the low food treatment, okay? So um, I found that as corbicula biomass increased, there was actually an increase in juvenile muscle growth. And all the pairwise comparisons were significant. Um, and oh, you know, the overall test was obviously significant as well. Um, so this was, like I said, completely opposite of what I expected and um, really, really baffled us, uh, you know, when we, when we first saw it. And when we look at the interaction, um, like I said earlier, that interaction term was significant um, to the model. And, you know, at, at low food abundance, there's a positive relationship between corbicula and growth. But at the low food abundance, there's, you know, basically no relationship. Um, and, and this created that interaction. So this was, you know, 
we hypothesized that there'd be an interaction, but um, it was exactly opposite the interaction that we um, expected. Now, um, previous findings have shown that, you know, there, there is definitely a context dependence when it comes to this relationship. And like I said earlier, they found there only a significant negative effect on fecal productivity um, in this study um, in the high food conditions and in no other food conditions. Um, so in summary of experiment three, uh, I found that corbicula negatively affects food abundance, which uh, you know, confirmed that new design uh, that, that we had done. Um, at the high food abundance, corbicula has a slight negative effect on growth or no effect. Um, and at low food abundance, corbicula had a positive effect on growth. Um, together, the, there was an interaction between food abundance and corbicula biomass uh, that was significant, albeit you know, the opposite of you know, what, what I had hypothesized that interaction would look like. Um, so an explanation for this you know, increased growth in higher corbicula, which makes no sense, um, could be that the production of pseudofeces and feces, like I was talking about earlier. So if you look at this picture here on the left with you know, a high corbicula treatment, you see all these little dark specks. Um, those are pseudofeces and feces from the corbicula, um, which are on the shells and they're also here at the bottom of the trays. Um, this, you know, they, they obviously were filtering a lot of, of food from the water, um, from the TOSS or from the measurements I found in, in terms of TOSS, which indicated that they were taking pretty substantial amounts of food from the suspension, um, but this production of pseudofeces and, and uh, feces may have been assisting um, the juvenile, or facilitating the juvenile muscles, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. When you compare this picture to this one, you see that there's basically no, you know, none of those dark specks, um, and this was from a control. So, at low food abundance, um, in no, you know, in uh, the control, so no corbicula, food is pretty evenly distributed um, in terms of phytoplankton um, in the suspension and probably in the sediment as well. Um, it's evenly distributed and it's also scarce. So um, the mussels, um, this being a, a mussel, will just filter um, and it will pick up phytoplankton, you know, every once in, in a while. But in comparison, when corbicula are present, they are obviously filtering a lot of the food out of the suspension. Um, but then they are producing a lot of pseudofeces and feces that they deposit on the sediment. And this feces and pseudofeces probably contains a, a ton of, or not a ton, but at low food abundances, you know, some um, organic matter that is still viable as food for these juvenile mussels. Um, and previous studies have shown that um, some of this algae actually can pass through the bivalves completely undamaged. So um, they're, what they're doing is likely concentrating this food uh, closer to the juvenile muscles, making it more available. Um, and uh, another, I guess, a supporting um, you know, finding of juvenile muscles is that uh, they rely pretty heavily on pedal feeding or deposit feeding. Um, and so they could be you know, accessing this food source um, where, you know, that's just not present here um, when corbicula are absent. Um, so in conclusion of my, uh, my studies, for experiment one, as expected, um, increased food resulted in increased growth. Um, and my, and growth and food abundance uh, were environmentally relevant, which indicated that it was possible to, um, you know, run experiments in these systems uh, that would that could generalize to the wild. Um, oh yeah, one thing one thing um, I forgot to mention. So as you can see by the tray water, it's not really um, you know it's not flowing all that fast, um, and it and the flow rate is about 100 milliliters a minute. Um, it's not clear how this interaction would really play out in the wild because uh, especially in places with higher flow. Um, because in, in, the net, in the wild, it, it's likely that this feces and pseudofeces would get washed downstream um, or eaten by other you know, organisms. So it's, 
you know, this may only apply to, you know, slower moving water um, habitats or depositional areas, but it's really unclear exactly how, um, you know, juvenile mussel growth in the wild, you know, due to, to, to feces and pseudo feces de deposition um, would look. Um, so that's still a little bit unclear. Um, sorry, experiment two, um, corbicule had no effect on food abundance or growth, um, but this was likely due to the system's design, which made it difficult to interpret um, my results. Um, basically, as a response to that uh, system design, I ran experiment three and found that growth was affected by both food abundance and corbicula. Um, and the effect of corbicula was dependent on food abundance. Um, however, the nature of the effect was completely opposite of what I had hypothesized. So with that, I'd like to um, conclude by thanking my advisors, Dr. Stephen Price and Dr. Wendell Haig, um, who I just, you know, I lucked out um, getting these, these guys as, as my advisors, and I learned a ton um, under their, um, their guidance. Uh, so I'm very appreciative of um, the time that they invested in me. Um, also my committee members, Dr. Monty McGregor and Dr. Chris Barton, my funding sources, and a special thanks to the CMC staff um, who were very, very instrumental in um, helping me uh, conduct these experiments. Dr. Monty McGregor, who's also a committee member, um, was generous enough to allow me to have laboratory space and um, lended me the, the juvenile muscles for the experiments. Um, Andy McDonald, who uh, taught me um, as much as he could about recirculating aquaculture systems and designs and, um, you know, rearing juvenile muscles and physiology. And um, he was a, a great teacher for me, for sure, in the laboratory. And then also Adam Shepard, Megan Owings, Travis Bailey, Travis Williams, and Julianne Jacobs, who um, basically just treated me like uh, one of the employees there, um, or like I was no different, um, and also um, facilitated a lot of my experiments and, and help me along the way. So with that, I would like to conclude by taking any questions.